All right, so an, our next speaker is Seth Ament. Uh, he is from uh, Institute for System, Biolo uh, System Biolo Biology, Seattle. So he's going to talk about reconstruction and analysis of tissue-specific transcriptional regulatory networks uh, with uh, Trina. Hi, thanks everyone for sticking around till the end. Um, so this is work that I'm doing in the lab of Nathan Price up in Seattle. Um, I'll be setting up my own lab at the University of Maryland this fall, so excited to expand all of this work there. Um, so the, the big work, the, the big question that I'm interested in is really how do we go from DNA sequences towards um, higher level phenotypes? I think it's you know, obviously the kind of big, big picture that many of us are interested in. Um, and that this involves a transition from DNA through a series of networks to the, hypo to the kinds of phenotypes, higher level phenotypes like behavior that, that we really care about modeling. Um, but I'm interested in this first phenotype of molecular networks and gene expression as, as a step that we can perhaps begin to make some progress in understanding. And that's, I think, the power of ENCODE for, for many of us. This is my first ENCODE meeting, so it's great to be able to thank all of you in person for the data. Um, so the approach that we've been taking to reconstruct transcriptional regulatory networks um, involves really trying to, through machine learning, integrate uh, many different kinds of data to predict um, in two different domains. First, we'd like to understand where transcription factors bind in the genome, given information about the motifs that they recognize and a variety of annotations of the chromatin, including uh, DNA as well as um, enhancer annotations and, and evolutionary conservation. And then, given um, that we can predict those binding sites, can we use that information together with gene expression to predict um, how transcription factors regulate um, their target genes across the genome and to then use that to understand um, the kinds of changes that occur in disease. So, um, and in each of these, we've developed machine learning approaches, ensemble machine learning approaches to, um, to solve these problems. So this is a, a work in progress. Um, but this is sort of a status report on, on, on what we've learned so far. So the first is that um, there are a handful of methods that have been developed so far for DNA's footprinting. Um, what we're finding is that if you combine those methods together and, and include additional kinds of annotations um, from chromatin states and evolutionary conservation of particular sites, um, one can improve the ability to uh, predict transcription factor binding sites um, in the absence of chip seek. So in other words, we can predict uh, chip seek peaks um, from, from the other data um, with, in this case, um, a single transcription factor, but this appears to generalize so that we can build models from a subset of, trans using the chip seek from a subset of transcription factors and find um, binding sites for additional transcription factors, allowing us to build models for hundreds of transcription factors in any tissue for which there's DNA and some chromatin annotations. Um, second, um, I think a harder problem is given a distribution of transcription factor binding sites, uh, can we go from there to predict the target genes of those transcription factors? So this problem relates to the problem of connecting enhancers to their target genes, but I think it's even a bit harder uh, because what we'd like to know is given, uh, is, is whether a specific transcription factor is likely to regulate a target gene. So in this case, I'm learning on shRNA microarray um, experiments where transcription, each of 59 transcription factors was knocked down and then microarrays were used in lymphoblastoid cells um, to, to figure out a set of genes that were differentially expressed. So I think strikingly a number of methods that have been used um, to build transcriptional networks in the past have, have no enrichment whatsoever for targets found um, by, by shRNA knockdowns. So this includes, um, there's essentially no relationship between um, for instance, targets predicted by the arachne method, which is widely used for, for reconstruction tr transcriptional networks um, as compared to <laughs> these methods. So that's, I think, a bit disappointing because obviously we'd like to be able to make these predictions. Um, there seems to be a small amount of signal rough, you know, from simply looking at Pearson correlations and from um, bindings, transcription factor binding sites predicted by um, our method. Um, across a variety of different ranges around each transcription start site. Um, but what we're able to find now is that by using an ensemble um, of these predictions, bo incorporating both transcription factor binding sites and co-expression, we can, can begin to predict um, in a generalizable way which genes are going to be differentially expressed when you knock down the transcription factor. 
So that suggests that we're starting to be able to get some signal here. And I think we can probably continue to bump up these um, areas under the rock curves. So that's encouraging. What I think is a little bit easier and I think is actually quite, quite encouraging is that um, if we do know a set of transcription factors that we think that bind in the region around a particular gene and we combine their expression patterns, we can actually do quite well in predicting the expression of those target genes. So that suggests that given that we do know which transcription factors are relevant, we can learn an enormous amount about the activity of a network based on just that really relatively small number of regulators. So in this case, you can see that we're able to predict the expression of over 10,000 genes in the human brain based on the expression of their regulator regulators. So putting these things together, um, we're able to build a model for uh, transcriptional regulation in the human brain, and now we're expanding this to a number of other tissues, um, where we start out with um, around four and a half million um, transcription factor binding sites predicted by DNA seq and other methods from ENCODE, and other data from ENCODE, um, together with external uh, transcriptomic data, in this case, 2,700 microarrays from the Allen Brain Atlas. And we end up with a data with a transcriptional network that incorporates targets for 700 transcription factors um, regulating 11,000 target genes through 200,000 interactions. So um, the real key, I think, for any such method is does it allow us to learn interesting things about biology? Um, so my, my key interest, I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I'm very interested in understanding the mechanism of psychiatric disorders. Uh, so we applied these networks built with um, these methods to try to understand master regulator transcription factors and causal regulatory variants in three psychiatric disorders, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and major depression. And we identified a set of transcription factors um, whose predicted target genes were strongly enriched among differentially expressed genes in the prefrontal cortex in each of these three diseases. Um, among these, the one I've circled here, PU3F2, is especially interesting because it's among a small number of genome-wide significant loci for bipolar disorder risk. So that's independent evidence that that transcription factor may be involved in a causal way in bipolar disorder. Um, we then tried to use the transcription factor binding sites annotated from our model to try to understand among the haplotypes associated with risk for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia um, whether we could identify causal variants on those haplotypes. And again, we were at least for a few loci able to identify very interesting variants, including in this case a predicted binding site for the same transcription factor, PU3F2, um, near the in the promoter of the VRK2 gene. Um, and we've now done luciferase assays and some additional functional validations to demonstrate that in fact uh, this, this variant in the VRK2 promoter um, modulates the activity of that promoter in a PU3F2 dependent fashion. So we're, it seems like we're able to identify at least one uh, functional variant on that risk haplotype using our methods. So uh, the software for this is uh, up on GitHub on the, uh, through the Price Lab, um, and we're rapidly trying to get this out there so that we can generalize this and build a whole set of tissue-specific models. Thanks.